Baltimore. Um, and, and arts integration is something that has always been integral to my teaching practice. Um, it was uh, the starting point of my doctoral research and my dissertation, um, and uh, which has led me in many different directions. And what's interesting is esteem is just another way of saying arts integration. And, um, and I, I could argue about how the arts bring critical thinking, bring um, the ability for perseverance, to sit with ambiguity, um, to have ownership of your learning, and all of those kinds of things. Uh, but what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about the arts through a STEM unit. So I'm going to talk about a STEM unit that gained some steam last semester with one of my graduate students in Southwest Baltimore Charter School in Baltimore City. Uh, so this is an amazing charter school and they believe in real world experiences and making sense of the things we learn. And so second graders were learning about simple machines. They were learning about pulleys levers, um, wheel and axles, and uh, they went into a, a business that hired adults with uh, different kinds of special needs, and they met the adults who were doing certain tasks in this industry, and they came back into the classroom, and they, they talked about, they gave names to what they thought the people were doing, like the one person, Rick was the bag sealer, and they talked about what kind of machine he was using to seal the bag. Uh, and the, my intern, who's an art education major, uh, was really intrigued by this, but she said the kids understood it theoretically, but it didn't really sink in and make sense. So what she decided to do, this is Rochelle Vargas, she's the graduate student who created this unit I'll be talking about. Um, what she did was she first started with a peer assessment, and she had these different drawings of different kinds of simple machines, trying to see, she wrote this with them as they were identifying what the machines were. So trying to see, do they really understand their functions? And then from what she understood, she realized that they understood the functions, but not necessarily the lived experience of these kinds of machines. And so what I would like to argue for right now is that the arts create this relationship where you have a point of entry that is that brings you to the lived experience through the experiences of the arts in that through a really good STEAM unit, you have a dance between the two and it, it, it weaves in and out um, so that eventually it all becomes part of the same fabric. Okay, so, so at the same time, Rochelle was observing these second graders and the second graders were having a really hard time having empathy for one another. In other words, they were pulling pigtails and pinching each other, right? Um, and so she said, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have them design for empathy. So she had them design something that solved a problem for someone else in the school so that they start to think beyond themselves. And then, and then she really wanted them to develop the dispositions of inquiry and reflection throughout the entire process of what they would be designing and creating. And so she made this visual in the classroom and she said, you know, you come up with an idea and then you try it out, test it and revise it. Very simple design thinking framework. And what I really appreciated is she said, you know, at each step of the way, you go back to the problem. What is the problem you're trying to solve? So, so for every lesson in her unit, she not only had them talk about the prototype, but it was a neurosocial problem. They tested it out, it's a neurosocial problem, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and and at the, I should make sure the art educator was here. She first had them explore with materials and gave them a challenge of, you know, what are ways that you can learn two pieces of cardboard with understanding and two force fields that work differently. They identified the force field. And, and it was great. collaboration and sharing before they even went into they explored the materials. She had some central students um, with how they connected the two pieces of cardboard, what they, they could use this to make something. So getting them to think about use, not just with how materials can come together. And then, and then this brought into new ideas of how things might be connected or extended. 
Um, and, and then she brought in the idea of, and this is where I think the arts come in really beautifully in the idea of STEM curriculum, is that she, she made little, little notebooks for them in the shape of toolboxes. So they were constantly thinking about the tools they were developing. Um, but she really wanted them to think about, you know, good note taking looks like images and text. And the one example she engaged them with was the, basically the obsolete cell phone, which they thought was hilarious, that cell phones used to not fit in your pocket. Um, and uh, so now I'd like to tell you the story of Logan and Zion. Uh, they decided that the problem, I don't know if you can read that, the problem that they wanted to solve is that the, their lunches are just simply too heavy to carry to the cafeteria. And that they needed to create something for the class so that the class did not have to carry their lunches. And so they said, we need a cart. And then they thought about what would be the simple machine components that would make a cart that would hold the lunches. My phone went to sleep, hold on. Okay. Um, and, and they started thinking about, you know, okay, the lunch, has, it has wheels. It needs to have wheels. Um, and, you know, the, the wheels, make it so you could go around the table. So then they're trying to think of not only the function, but then how does it serve its purpose in the space where it needs to go and be used? And they made an initial prototype. And um, from that initial prototype was just to think about how do you put materials together? How do you maybe make that work? There were some little styrofoam bottoms of cups on the side to serve as wheels, as the wheel and axle. Um, and then they tested it with each other. And, and she had this whole wonderful system of them showing each other how their prototype would work, giving each other feedback, and then they would revise their prototype, and they did this a number of times. Um, and, uh, okay, so now I'll go to Kambira and Titus. These were two students who had a really hard time with the piggy tail pulling and the pinching, right? They had a hard time working together collaboratively. And it was, it was interesting because the, the problem they wanted to solve was that it was just too much work to pick up your eraser when it falls on the floor. So they needed to create a pulley system to pick up the eraser and put it back on your desk. Um, and, and so they had, so really this is Kambira's work. Um, you know, pulleys can help us. And then um, you can see a, a, a box rope spool, they're trying to think about, okay, does it need to be flat, does it need to be boxes, how do we make this work? Um, and then their revised prototype, and I, I, oh shoot, the video's not here. So um, the revised prototype of, of them seeing how it goes between the front and the back, and there actually were two pulley systems working concurrently, which was part of their collaborative process. Okay, so, um, STEAM develops, like I said in the beginning, I, I could simply talk about the things that we often talk about that the arts bring. Um, but what I'd like to say is that bringing the arts into the STEM disciplines really helps students become engaged citizens. It helps them become critically literate, to look at the world around them, to seek their own problems that they want to solve, to find solutions for how they would solve that, to develop the, the literacy skills Right? Which, which could be all different forms of literacy skills in order to solve said problems. Um, it gives them a personal agency that, wow, I, if I see a problem, I can solve it. Right? I have that power to figure it out. Um, and, and one thing that was you know, throughout the, 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 cart, the cart in the cafeteria problem um, was that throughout the whole thing was some reflection and problem solving, right? And so when the wheels wouldn't turn, what did they need to do differently so that the axle could work, could serve its purpose properly? Um, and so they had to go back and forth between technique and concept, between problem and um, application. And, and then collaboration, which was really great by, um, Rochelle really intuitively wanted to help these students develop a level of empathy and that disposition in life in general, but what she found in the short term was that, wow, the kids really started to get to know each other and enjoyed working together and found ways to plan ideas for being helpful. And it really flipped the dialogue. Um, and then lastly, uh, my, my research in my dissertation when I was here was on 
uh, what structures in a school environment help develop and sustain an arts integration program in a public school? And um, one of the outcomes that I found to be really fantastic was in interviews with teachers, I learned that teachers were really inspired by collaborating with their colleagues and learning from each other, that it gave them a sense of interconnectedness with one another. It really increased teacher retention at the school where I was uh, conducting the case study. Um, and really, to, to sum it all up, it gave them wonderment and joy in their teaching. And, and they felt like they were always seeking new possibilities. They were energized in what they were doing. And that, in turn, created a dialogue in a school that extended outside of the classroom quite wonderful. Um, did I make 10 minutes, Judy? Oh, look at that. Oh, here we go. So, so I, I put my email up there if anyone is interested in following up. And thank you very much. Uh, I am coming to this conversation from art museum education. Um, so as I'm thinking about the work that we do in art museums, I want to echo a little bit of what Judy said and say that, you know, museums have been in the education field since their founding in this country. Um, and educators were really brought into the picture uh, to help connect visitors um, with works of art in the collection. So that diagram that you showed of these sort of overlapping spheres, that's very much a part of what the work of a, a, museum, a good museum educator is all about. Um, so let's see, let me pull up. Um, so, in, you know, in some circles, and maybe for some of you, uh, but hopefully you've had some good experiences in museums in your life, but in some circles, uh, museums are still thought of as a place to consume what is already known about cultural objects or artifacts from antiquity um, or works of art that have been deemed worthy of preservation. But what's particularly exciting about museums and, and contemporary museum education is that there's not only a willingness but a very strong desire to move away from the authoritative voice of the institution and toward an exploration with and interacting and engaging with 21st century skills um, to embrace the unknown develop curiosity in our students and visitors, um, and to expand the notions of what's possible between museums and schools, classroom teachers and museum educators, and students and works of art. So that's the part I'm gonna focus on this morning is the relationship between the student and the work of art. And I'm gonna throw just a little bit of theory into this and have you think about, again, those overlapping spheres. Um, the student brings a sort of life world with them when they come to the museum, and this is true for all of us, but in particular thinking about students, all the experiences they've had up until the point that they come into the museum and the work that we do together while we're in the museum. So that's their sense of themselves, their understanding of being in this new and different place. Um, so sort of acknowledging the experience for them, their life world, and then connecting that with what can be called the object world of the work of art. Um, so it also has lived, and, and the works of art that we're gonna look at have lived for many, many hundreds, if not thousands of years. Um, so there's a whole history there. And while it's an inanimate object, to think of it also as something that's bringing a whole history, um, bringing connotations that resonate today, but also have a history themselves. Um, so I'm gonna use as an example some work that I've been doing with the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, and this work is specifically, I'm looking at um, tours that I've given and collaborations that I've done with teachers around Buddhist art in particular. So looking at the transmission and changes over time of Buddhist art as it traveled, um, more often than not, teachers are coming because their students are studying the Silk Road. Um, so when a, when a group of students come in and they've done some reading and some learning about the Silk Road, um, they want to share, right? So this is, we're talking like uh, early high school, typically like middle school, high school students. And so when we start, you know, I kind of say to them, it's like, tell me, what do you know about the Silk Road? Let's talk about it. And that gives me an opportunity as an educator to find out what they know, um, but also gives them a chance to show off a little, show off in front of their teachers. Um, and then I bring them, and, and you know, knowing that we're gonna be talking about Buddhist art, um, I actually start by saying like, um, let's talk a little bit about clothes today. What are you all wearing? And we talk about their clothes, and we talk about where those clothes were made, where the dye from the clothes came from, um, where they were sold, 
um, if they decide that they don't want their clothes anymore and they donate them, where those clothes end up, right? So sort of illustrating the fact that we live in this very global system now and clothing is a perfect example of something that travels all over the world. Um, and then we start in the Greek and Roman galleries. So for those of you who don't remember um, your history of the Silk Road, uh, it really all started in, in Greek and Roman culture, right? And this sort of desire to um, trade and often the, the sort of facts that they're giving me when I ask them about the Silk Road are about the things that were traded. So the fabrics, the silk, the spices, um, the, the tools, this kind of thing. Um, so then we talk about what we're seeing. And because we've started talking about clothes, we talk about the clothes. Um, but they also talk about the expression on the people's faces. They, they bring up a lot of interesting things about their sort of perception of what life was like for these people. And from there, um, we travel. Uh, fully across the museum into um, ancient Gandhara. So this piece is from the third century, and it is in fact a Buddhist work of art. So we spend some time with this piece, and we talk about um, what they're seeing that they see in common with what we had just seen in the Greek and Roman galleries, um, and what they see that's different. So very quickly, you can probably see that there's connection between the type of clothing that's being worn um, but you have some very clear Buddhist symbols. So down at the bottom, there's a, a sort of series of figures that are very small at the base, and that's almost at eye height for the students. So they like to talk about that and what they're seeing there, and some Buddhist imagery there. Um, the third eye, between the two eyes there, uh, the Ushnisha, which is the bump on the head, um, what looks like a halo around his head, and we talk about the mashup of culture that was happening on the Silk Road. So this is a classic example in works of art that not only illustrate, but really sort of transform their thinking about how cultures do mash up and how you can see that in works of art. Um, this sort of bringing together of Greco-Roman um, style and uh, Buddhist uh, ideology. And then moving, um, as, as Buddhism moved uh, both south and north from its sort of homeland of what is essentially northern India and uh, in modern day Pakistan, um, we go to Thailand and we look at, to, we compare what the image looks like, both in the clothing, but also in the expressions, additional arms being added to the figure, still a Buddhist image, but very different um, visual information that the students are, are noticing. Um, and then north, going all the way over to Japan, and, and this is where students start to acknowledge and recognize their assumptions about where people come from. So talking about um, facial expression, but also features of the body um, and where one might think this figure comes from and these kind of assumptions that we make when we're looking at visual information. Um, and then backing up a little bit to China, all of these are Buddhist bodhisattva figures. So they essentially tell much the same story in the Buddhist um, canon, um, but the, the visual manifestation of these figures in the history of art really brings it alive for students um, in a way that they may not have have considered before. And we're going chronologically here. So this, this piece is um, Chinese from the 1200s, um, 1282 I think it is. And this is the same figure, the same Buddhist bodhisattva figure in a female form from the 16th century. So talking about that, like a complete transition in gender with students is very, very interesting and brings up a lot of um, good conversation about why an uh, artwork image would be illustrated and created in the way that it is um, during that time. Um, one other quick example is the Islamic galleries at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I've been working with a math teacher at a renewal school, a secondary school in Williamsburg. And she's very interested in, in using art to get students, her sixth grade students, excited about geometry. Um, so again, not thinking of this as an add-on, but really thinking about it from the beginning of the unit. How can her students get excited about geometry using works of art from the collection? And she and I looked through many, many, many wonderful geometric forms um, in the collection to try to find just the right piece. And they were working on a unit on um, determining area. And we came across this that is on exhibit at the museum and talking with students about um, the problem that needs to be solved here, right? What's missing about this image? So both determining the area from a mathematical perspective, but also essentially completing the drawing and how you would do that mathematically. Um, and, and, and really helping the students, again, bring this back to life um, through, their, through their sketching and through their drawing. 
themselves. So these are just a few examples of um, a kind of complementary piece that museums and museum education can play within the conversation for STEAM and classrooms. Um, again, that relationship between uh, classroom teachers and museum educators really being able to work together to find what complements one another. Um, because this isn't just about an add-on, right? These works of art, and, and also being in the space of the museum, I think is such a, an opportunity for students to live um, out in the world and use the things that they're learning in the classroom in these larger contexts, both in history um, and in present day. Um, I'm not sure how I'm doing on time. Whoa. <laughs> Yeah, so I'll just leave saying this, that um, when we're looking at works of art from history like this, and especially when kids are thinking about history and sometimes maybe not so excited about that as well, um, there's something about the contextualized place, the social and political things that are influencing um, the artistic choices, really the problem solving that art and, and, the, and artists who are making works go through each time um, they're making a work of art, and that you know, for something like this, it's very exciting to see how students kind of have this aha moment um, with what art has been doing for hundreds of years and still continues to do today. So, thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Sean Justice, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the, some of the research I've been doing in terms of how art education plays into STEAM. One of the big questions for us in the world of education, as most of you already know, is that the question of how does art education affect the STEM dialogue, and that's a big question that we've all been dealing with right here. It becomes a much more difficult question to answer, to approach, when we start to get into real sort of granular what's happening in education research around the country in different, a in different aspects. For example, one of the big questions, very difficult, intractable question is, why do science achievement scores hold so stable across um, K to 8 education? When, no matter what variable we look at, we can't seem to make a dent in them. We can explain them, socioeconomic, racial, ethnic and a variety of other ways, but we, how do we begin to modify what's going on to decrease the persistent in inequities in science education? My research in arts education uh, seems to be pointing towards some ways of addressing this, and I want to just briefly go through some of those ideas. One of the challenges that I find when I talk to principals and superintendents and teachers and pre-service, in-service teachers, audiences like this, is that when I say the word art education, you see this, and pretty much that's all you see. And that actually is a challenge of language. Now, I, as an artist myself, as an art educator, I never want to see pastels and paints and clay leave the art room. I want those to always be present. But it's incredibly important that we realize that the internet and the internet of things is changing everything across the schools. And how we begin to see these tools and these technologies, these new computational materials in our art, art education is a really a very interesting problem that research is just barely beginning to address. Interestingly, practice is way ahead of the research on this. When I go to universities and colleges and, and K-12 institutions all over the country, who do I find running the makerspace or the fab lab or the, art edu the, uh, the technology program in the college of education? I find artists, I find musicians, I find glass blowers. When I ask them, a woman in South Carolina last year. So what's your background? She's leading the brand new university level College of Education makerspace in STEM education. I was a glass blower at Tyler School of Art. That was my background. This is not uncommon. This is not uncommon in my research. The, um, my research partner here at TC, her name is Marta Cabral. She heads up the Early Childhood Center for Art Education, Early Childhood Center, the uh, Rita Gold Early Childhood Center. She's the director of art education at Rita Gold. The research that she and I have been doing around new technologies, so things like augmented reality, for example, if, you're, if anybody's familiar with that idea, where you point a, a smartphone device at an object or at an image, and you receive via the internet or via other technologies information about what you're pointing at. What we're seeing is that the kids, the gestures of the kids, begin to build new communities and new collaborations from the act of engaging with their peers. So it's very much counter the narrative that we see in the media all the time about screen, the screen, the, the, the addiction to screens, for example. What we see is that for very young children, we're talking three, four, five-year-olds, they engage in a social interaction, they build communities on the fly, and these technologies today are very much available to art educators, whether they have a technology background or not. 
One thing that art education brings to this conversation is a question of materials, is a question about materiality. And any of you who have ever sat at a potter's wheel and learned how to throw a pot, you'll know it's something of what I'm talking about. And if you haven't ever tried this, stop everything and go find a ceramic studio and do, and do this for yourself. When we engage with materials, we're engaging with an in-between space, in-between intentionality that we bring as human beings that are seemingly in debt in the control of our destiny and control of what we're learning and in control of knowledge as a noun. We bring it into an action. We bring it into a way of communication with the material itself. If you're in control of the clay, what that means is that you have, you have lost control of the clay because the pot will not be balanced until you learn how to give up that sense of uh, extreme control. This is a sense of materiality that I think brings uh, for us as, edu as art educators a, a lot of traction around this idea that when our hands are on, our minds are in. This is a fully embodied, uh, the neurological structure, the pathology of the brain support this in many different research uh, areas going on right now. Um, in Johns Hopkins, for example, using F fMRI machines in the medical school, they're talking about how jazz improvisation maps out neural structures in the brain that look a lot like, in fact, almost identical to what's happening when a potter throws a pot. These things are happening across so many different domains of, of cognition today that it's almost impossible for anybody to sit down and say, hands-on does not equal mind. So what I'm interested in is where there's a transition between the materials of science and the materials of math and the materials of art. I don't find a, a distinction in terms of the way we engage as human beings. The metaphor I use is the metaphor of a conversation. And I think you know what I mean if you remember the last time you had a good, long conversation with a close friend, a close colleague, a relative, sitting over a cup of coffee, talking about what matters to your life. We respond to each other in unpredictable, indeterminate ways. I say something, you respond, you don't know what I'm going to say. I don't know how you're going to respond, and then I respond to that. Knowing is a verb. Knowing is an action. Knowing is an emergent unfolding of reality between us. One of the affordances of digital materiality, which we all are, are uh, constantly railing against, is the notion that the internet brings and, and aggregates like people talking about like things. It's preaching to the choir. It's constantly saying what we already know. We, we diminish our audiences in this way. Art educators know how to disrupt that diminishment because we, in art education, by focusing on the materials, by looking at uh, paint or clay or, or electronics, simple electronics, what we do is encourage students to respond from where they are and what's interesting to do. Ashley was just talking about this and exactly what Shiloh was talking about. This is something that comes from art education. This is where we begin to see the answer that art education might have towards questions about the persistence of uh, science and knowledge gaps. In, uh, in, I do these workshops all over the country. This is the first graders in Hawaii, and we're looking at science education materials where it's part of a learning about how do first graders begin to make sense of circuitry. We do make sense of circuitry, but in the process of making sense of circuitry, we're talking about the story of circuitry. Why does the bulb get hot? Why does my finger look red? We talk about circulation. We talk about energy. We talk about the way universal uh, constant constraints connect with other universal constraints. It's through the story and it's through the metaphor. Part of this is uh, very transferable, I think, and that's a troubling word in a lot of ways because nothing is transferring. We're creating it as we go. It's a constant emergent unfolding. So this is a first. This is an elementary school teacher for the first time in her entire life at a workshop in Chicago two weeks ago, introducing her to so-called science materials and asking her to play with them like we would play with clay or paint or some other kinds of materials in an art education room. And she's making a a she's making this, which for her was a story about crow and a story about how knowledge disperses through the, uh, the through the universe. One thing that I keep coming back to in my own teaching and my research is the relationship of gesture, that our bodies uh, learn to gesture through the universe as we are moving from the earliest possible ages. And anybody who's ever spent time with a very young child will understand how the beginning crawling, walking, rolling, beginning to reach is augmented and, and, and uh, amplified by the uh, caregivers around them. These ideas come from psychological developmental theory, of course, which some of you may recognize. But my focus and my interest in that is how do we think about technology as a gesture, technology that extends our reach, whatever the technology is, 3D printers or paintbrushes. Within the, within the world of science education, what I find missing, and I, I find this missing in the research at the very deep level in terms of it's in the language of the research, is that there's an ignorance of story. 
And in the National Writing Project, uh, which uh, one of my colleagues, David Cole, who's on the East and West Coast, is working with simple electronics to get English teachers and language teachers to bring simple electronics into illustrating poetry, into illustrating words and history books and illustrating ideas that come out of dance or come out of music, is that when you tie these things together with tools that are normally considered to be outside of art education, for example, simple electronics, batteries, light bulbs, paper clips, wires, you begin to integrate the idea of story that connects us to what we're what we think we're doing as human beings in the first place. This is an example of where the challenge is. One of the biggest challenges is the, what I call the make to illustrate challenge, where the teacher gives an assignment, the students read a report, and then they build a diorama to illustrate what they have learned. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about make to surprise, where we share agency with the materials, like a potter and a clay on a potter's wheel. Whether those materials are code or computer code, learning to program, or whether they're cardboard and simple electronics. This is an example which I'll leave you with is a high school student in uh, Philadelphia, high school in Philadelphia. This is called her metaphor scarf. And her, her challenge was self-generated. She told me a bunch of STEAM kids were sitting around one day thinking about how they could make something that connected with their lives. That was the prompt from their STEAM teacher, from their technology teacher. How do objects become significant in your life? They played through a lot of different ideas. What she came up with through challenges from her student, with her colleagues, with her high school colleagues, was how does her craft, that's my timer, but I just want to finish that sentence. The, uh, the how does her craft, which was crochet and knit, connect with the history of technology, the history of language? And so this is a crocheted scarf using Morse code for double stitch and single stitch to uh, knit into the, the scarf itself this phrase, which she then gave to her mentor, whose favorite color was orange. And that's an example of how when we open up through art education, thinking about connecting through stories and through metaphors, that we begin, I think, and this is the research that I'm involved in, we begin to approach these persistent problems of inequities between math science edu uh, engineering and technology education. Maybe. That's my hope. It's what good teachers have been doing for many, many years. I'm now going to show you uh, an example of, um, of uh, uh, an educational activity with a group of what would be the equivalent of eighth grade students in the United Kingdom. This happened a number of years ago before we even began to think about documenting the pra our, our teaching practice. Um, and so this is a, a video that I've made with one of my graduate students here. It is made from notes that were taken at the time. And so we have recreated this whole educational experience. And what I think is important about it is that you can see in this experience the ideas that these three folk have been talking about emerging from things that kids actually do and think. So STEAM isn't a project or an idea that we're imposing upon kids. STEAM is an idea that actually emerges from the real way that children engage with each other and engage with their world and engage with ideas and the stories that are composed in that form. So this is five minutes, and then we will open everything up to questioning, because I'm sure by now you've got tons and tons of questions you want to ask us. So um, this is the story of Pythagoras. <laughs> Not once upon a time, but in the early 1970s. The setting is a comprehensive high school, a cast of characters, 30 pupils, and two teachers. One an art teacher, the other an English teacher, both heads of their departments. The two teachers had for a long time discussed the complementarities of visual and verbal languages, and so created a co-taught word course in which a group of 8th grade pupils came to understand that while words and images often take the same subject matter, each symbolic mode allows for different perspectives and diverse interpretations. The teachers were given the possibility to step right outside the box by two fortunate occurrences. First, the art teacher was in a large, empty space in a disused theatre. And second, the school principal gave permission to withdraw the pupils from school for two whole days. After much discussion, the teachers chose as their starting point the Pythagoras theorem, mainly because of its strong visual presence which they, in advance of the pupils arriving at the space, marked out on the floor with masking tape. 
When, full of curiosity, the pupils arrived for class, they were invited to stroll around and sit anywhere they chose. The pupils were asked to describe it in some detail, and then to discuss and suggest other meanings beyond mathematics. What emerged fairly quickly and around considerable consensus was the sense that the theorem represented everyday life. The large square represented the working class of London, the middle square, the middle class, and the smallest, the rich or posh folk of the city. But what might the central triangle mean? For the working class, it represented a children's playground. For the middle class, a golf course. And for the rich, a space for a new factory to make them even richer. In short, it represented something everyone wanted, but for vastly different reasons. The teachers asked the group what life would be like in each of the squared sections, and if they would like to actually build an environment for each of the squares to show how the life in each case would be different. The pupils were given permission to leave the building in order to invade the local street market for scrap materials. Back on site, a pile of boxes became a wall, crumpled paper, a fast-running river, a suspended cloth with a hole in the middle, a t-shirt, and a length of wood painted white, all in Dover factory. Let's make a play, let's tell a story, was greeted with universal acclaim. The group came up with three scenarios, a day in the rich man's factory, oh. a middle-class chat on the street, oh. and a working-class disaster. Now, talking across social class groups, the central theme that emerged was the drowning of a working class child. Following the play acting, a whole raft of questions arose about the way human life is valued by different segments of society. Let's take it to court, was the next suggestion that enlightened the imaginations. The courtroom activity lasted for a whole half day before time ran out. School was over, even late that day, and no resolution could be reached. Taking two more classes out of school for two full days caused consternation. The general consensus was that time was wasted. At the next faculty meeting, six pupils were invited to represent the school <coughs> group to tell their version of events. They explained how meaningful the experience had been for them. They had to draw upon their knowledge of different disciplines, mathematics, art, language, social studies, civics, and history, and understand how each could interplay with the others. They were able to communicate, speculate, plan, and shape ideas in different forms, visually, verbally, spatially, musically, and audibly. The proportions of the Pythagorean theorem learned abstractly in school were immediately found in the human world without any coaching from the teachers. The youngsters had discovered how to transgress usual conventions by using their minds, memories, and everyday experiences laced by imagination. Teachers actually trying to look very carefully at what the kids did, ask the next question, the next question. There's no telling, there was no instruction. Where would this go? How might it be? What do you think it's like? Um, and the creation of the story of, of, the, of the boy drowning um, was a, an extraordinary uh, event. Um, and we felt as teachers, we were just being taught by the kids. We were just following along. We neither of us knew that the kids knew all the things that they brought into, into their learning. It was one of the most remarkable learning experiences I think I have ever had. Um, so thank you for being patient audience. And we would love to hear your your, your stories or your, your questions would be wonderful. Basically, um, the main theme that I want to touch on is how technology can be looked at through the lens of narrative and these skills that we most generally associate with arts, and arts education. Yeah, exactly. That's so that's one of the things that I think art education actually has, brings to the table is the sense of the way I kind of in a sense, put it into a nugget, a, a little sound bite, is that in art education, often what happens is that we're leading with the materials, just like Judy just, just demonstrated, is that we lead with the materials, we let the materials become part of the conversation, and then we listen for the inquiry that arises. And so this happens with any materials, is what I would argue, whether you play, paint, cardboard, or electronic circuits. But instead of focusing the, the conversation around 
things like circuitry or how electrons flow, we're open to whatever comes out of that. And so if a child begins to talk about remembering a camping trip with their father and putting batteries on a flashlight, that gives the child a way to make a very strong personal direct connection with the notion of these materials as potentially something else. So that opens up the, and it depends how the teacher holds this. I mean, this is not something that is necessarily going to happen in a classroom unless a teacher is able to leave the space for that to happen. By letting the room, by letting the room fill up with stories around the memories or questions around what's happening or why does the bulb get hot, then we begin to bring into the conversation ways that students can connect with what we might have to fill out on our science uh, achievement test, which is understanding what circuitry works. And I would say this doesn't only work with first graders, it works with in-service teachers, eighth graders, high schoolers, and I've, I mean, it works based on my research, is what I'm saying. So, first of all, it's really cool to see like so many people, this whole conference, all these people who are interested in, in STEAM. I always feel like I'm sort of hiding being someone, I'm a math teacher with a BFA, also math and art background, and it's so cool to see other people. It's like a little community of us like, coming out of the woodwork. But um, my question is for Ashley. Um, so I've been to many educator workshops at the Met. Um, I've led geometry field trips at the Met. And um, I've only actually been to one workshop that was geared for math teachers. Um, I was just really wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how that um, collaboration with that math teacher came about. And um, if you see coming down, you know, in the sort of climate of STEAM as like the new buzzword, if you're seeing sort of a more math, um, like streamlined connection, or like pro pro professional development opportunities for math teachers, anything geared more towards specifically STEAM and like the Met. Yeah, thank you for asking about that. So that, um, <clears throat> that particular relationship with that teacher came out of a longer term partnership. So the first sort of examples that I was giving were like the sort of one time visits that schools often hopefully can fit into their schedule. Then there are teachers that I feel must be really lucky because they can have a longer term relationship with a museum. So with that teacher, that was a, that's a group of teachers that I'm working with for the entire year. And I meet with them about every month or six weeks and because we had that time, it really came out of their interest. So it's a PLC group, a professional learning community um, at that school, and it's a combination of um, Spanish teachers, Spanish language teachers, um, she's a math teacher, and then a social studies teacher. So it's been a real, um, kind of to the same point, an open-ended, we started, I came to the school first, then they came to the museum, and we didn't try to come up with any curriculum on either of those days. It was really just about exploring each other's environments and starting with materials. In this case, the materials are the works of art. Um, you can see why we naturally gravitated to the Islamic collections for um, a math unit. Uh, but I would say that that interest is definitely bubbling up a lot more. In fact, one of the um, full-time staff members at the Met, she has kind of your, your uh, life story, but the opposite. She started out in math and loves math. Um, and is now an art museum educator. So she's helping to sort of spearhead a lot. And I think a lot of times these things do come out of individual interests and relationships that we have and just growing those and building those. Um, but it certainly goes hand in hand with a kind of overall movement towards STEAM um, throughout. Does that answer your question? So hopefully more to come with, with math workshops at art museums. Uh, and I, I'm thinking of this, and again, I'm going outside the bowl as usual, and in terms of this new buzzword where we're trying to keep on responding to the hair pulling incident, and we're trying to keep kids in their seats and give the kids some, some value add and, and let's, let's get something going here, it's a thing called restorative justice that's happening in schools so that kids are, you know, now they're, they're now being, watching each other and they're doing some peer coaching and they're doing some, so, so that they can sit in a seat and so it's a more civilized way of looking at a kid who's caused the problem the kids are now doing the justice and resolving. I can see an artifact to move this forward. So I was wondering your opinion about that. So think of a kid court, where instead of going, you know, okay, the kid hit the kid, now you go straight from the classroom to the principal, from the principal to the jail or whatever. So, but I can see that middle step while we have peer-to-peer -peer consultation, peer-to-peer -peer working, that if there were artifacts or case studies, if this would in fact work. I just want your opinion on that. Okay. Um, in the, um, in the uh, design thinking world, there's the, the term yes and, and, um, and one of the things that Rochelle, which I 
did not say, what she incorporated within the unit was the using the term yes and rather than no but. And, um, and it worked really well in the sense that when a student or a group wasn't using it, they would raise their hand and say, Miss Rochelle, they're not using yes and. Um, and it started to create a culture of respect, of open dialogue, of, of, of deep listening rather than just proving a point. And, and I think that even little strategies like the yes and can become that middle step, right? Where you, you start to develop dispositions in the learners, you start to develop a culture in the school environment so that people are really open to listening to one another. An additional tack on this. One of the things we know is that teaching works well when you can engage what is being taught within the experience of the individual being taught. In other words, if we can help kids to bring their own experiences to the learning moment, such that we can root that learning within their experience, so it becomes their experience, so it's lodged within their experience, and then out of that move them forward wherever they and you are, are taking them, be it mathematics, be it science, being social studies, being being the arts, that rootedness in the personal experience and in the personal narrative makes learning real for kids. And we know that good teachers who do that don't have problems, so many problems in classrooms because kids have that sense of ownership over their own learning. They're not defeated by not understanding or knowing what it is they should think or do or however it relates to them. And so the trick is in the beginning, um, and that's why I think STEAM is so important, to understand, I think as Sean was saying, that, that you know the mind is multifunctional. Whether we're learning math or whether we're throwing a pot on the wheel or we're doing social studies, ideas are coming from a diverse range of human experience to inform that moment of learning. So it's not an isolated category. It's not just a, a bit of something that dangles independently in the child's psyche. It is something that belongs to a larger um, configuration of insight and understanding. Children these days are plagued with information. They can press a button and get information from anywhere. What we're talking about is how you take information and transform it into insight and understanding so that children can apply information across a broad spectrum of functions that they will need to play out in order to participate and, and exert ownership over their world. And so STEAM becomes really important in um, understanding that even complex cognitive structures are multi, are multi um, are configured out of many different kinds of experiences and they are multifaceted. And that our ideas turn themselves around. Um, and that really, I think, if you can get that across to kids, they don't get themselves because they own their learning. It's flexible. They can take it here, they can take it there, they can take it somewhere else and they're not locked in that sense. I didn't want to do with this. Uh, there were, uh, he, he, through the project method, encouraged students to spend a lot of time in, in all disciplines. So, you know, th th this is what he would um, encourage students to do. I would also remind you of a quote that, forgive me, I need my glasses here, uh, that Bertrand Russell said, Mathematics, rightly viewed, possesses not only truth, but supreme beauty. And I, uh, in, in a, I, I uh, show this uh, oh, over 50-year-old uh, video uh, that, that Disney put together, Donald and Mathematic Land. He links ma uh, music with, um, with um, uh, mathematics, you know, through Pythagoras. Pythagoras came up with the, the link between music and mathematics. So, you know, there, there's a lot of this um, cross-discipline. We just need to rediscover it, you know, I think. 
Can I, could I just say something about that? It is true, you know, this is the home of John Dewey and Maxine Green and all sorts of good and wonderful people who've done wonderful things. Um, the, the issue is this kind of work is hard to do. You can't learn it by rote. You've got to be with kids, you've got to engage with kids, you've got to understand where kids are coming from. Not only that, you've got to have yourself a broad and flexible mind so that as a teacher you can go perhaps into mathematics and you might not be a mathematician, but you know some good questions to ask. You might be going to science, as, as Sean was saying. Maybe you're not a scientist, but you know some good questions to ask. You know how to move into uh, a relationship with a teacher in another discipline so that you can begin to extend each other's insights and understandings. We don't do that well in education. And we've got to actually educate a whole new brand of teachers to do this well. It's not easy, you can't learn it by rote. It's not training anymore, it's education. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Thank you. Um, and thank these three great people for coming along.